13 years experience in the testing industry. During that time, he's decided to venture down the security and testing path. Um, while he's still involved in the, <laughs> while he's still involved in the context-driven uh, community, he currently works for New Voice Media. Uh, you've been there one year, yeah. uh, and he's a regular speaker at testing events. Uh, Travelling to Estonia tomorrow yes. to speak um, uh, for Nordic Testing Days. So, thank over you. Much. Much. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Um, if you'd like to sketch your hands, test it, hands up. Develop this, hands up. Any other kind of ops or engineers? Okay, hello. Okay. Just that said, I'm Dan Belling. Um, if you want to get hold of me or follow my blog, Get on me on Twitter at the Test Doctor, which will become apparent in a minute when you see my slides, um, where my sort of direction of learning comes from. Um, I work at New Voice Media, I've been there a year, I'm a test engineer, but in the last year I've got, got more interested and excited about security testing. A lot of that's to do with um, being bored about what I was doing in the last previous 10 years or so, I wasn't get, getting anything new out of my job, out of the jobs I was working on. So in 2010, <laughs> I was working as a QA manager at a firm in Bristol, and I was really not enjoying that, and I wasn't getting anything new out of that organisation, or new in terms of my own personal learning, and security was something I was really interested in, but it wasn't something that the organisations that I worked for were that interested in. Um, so that's kind of what I did that on a personal level, that's what I was getting into. And I ask myself these questions here. Am I really excited about my work anymore? And to be honest, I really wasn't. I was kind of getting bored with testing and wanted to do something different. Um, but I wanted to stay being a tester because it was a good career, or is a good career. But I wanted to find something new within that. And I really didn't want to be a manager. And I really didn't want to be into automation, because that's not my bag. So there's a few other avenues to go down to specialism. So that's performance, and the other one's security. And there are a few other areas you can pick, but that security is the kind of the one I've gone for. Um, and the other thing is my skill level. Did I have the skills to make those changes in my life, to make those changes in my career? And I, I can honestly say I was lacking in those areas. So this is kind of a journey of self-learning self and learning with the organisation that I was testing at. And this presentation is kind of taking you on that journey, which is why I've called it New Adventures in Software Testing. Because I've been down a lot of testing roads before, and not all, all of them led to happy places. But at the moment, I'm in a happy place with my work and my testing. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Okay, so... Have any of you here heard of Rob Lambert? He's a tester, my test lead at New Voice Media. So he's my manager. He's who I work for. I'm really lucky to work for him. Um, he's been in testing around about the same time as me, but he's taken a different road to me in that he leads people really effectively. I'm not a great leader of people. I like speaking in front of people, but if you ask me to manage another person, I find that really hard. I don't know why. I like talking and sharing information with people, but doing appraisals and stuff like that doesn't really interest me. But he wrote a book last year um, where he said this, to know what skills to focus on your learning, you need to know what skills you need for your chosen career, compared to what skills you currently have. The difference between the two is where you need to focus your learning. And I focus my learning on the gaps that I had in my security testing knowledge and develop that, because that's where I've become really interested, okay? So there's no point in picking up new piece of learning if you're not, uh, not going to enjoy what you're doing. I'd rather spend hours, um, sorry, an hour or half an hour learning something I really enjoy than spend half an hour uh, 
ten times that much learning something I really hate. So, that's why I've got down the screen for you. So, point security is a set, personal learning, personal interest. Um, without that context of learning, you're not going to get very far, I feel. And the more interest you've got in a topic, the more likely it is you can carry on down that road. And some of the organisations I worked with in the past, now I live in the southwest of England, um, in a place called Frew, it's near Bath. And a lot of the organisations around Bath and Bristol, and places like that, they're very much public sector, some banking, most of it's defence. There's a lot of MOD establishments down that way, because it's outside of London. So they're kind of out of the way, not in a risky area. Okay, so it's big MOD places in um, Bristol and Taunton and Cheltenham, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and if you work in the IT sector in that organisation, you will know somebody else who works at one of those places in the IT industry, and they probably know somebody else who does security testing at a very, very detailed level. So it's quite a small world in the Southwest testing community, and to get out of that and to develop my own learning, I had to really get out of the Southwest and test elsewhere. Um, and working at New Voice Media has kind of allowed me to do that because I'm not coming to London every day, which would be a hefty commute for me, but I'm coming to a place that nurtures testers, nurtures learning, and allows us to develop our own time and our own speed in things that we're interested in. Okay, I've got an innate curiosity about stuff. So we've got some kids here um, looking at this camera with this lady. I'm kind of like that. When I first started thinking about IT, you know, I grew up in the 1980s, like some of us here. Um, I had my first computer in the mid-80s, a um, Spectrum, and after that I had a Commodore Amiga. And I was always trying to, when those computers broke down, I took them apart to find out how they worked and tried to put them back together again. Not necessarily with great results. And there's another story. When I was young, growing up, I would visit my grandmother in, in Exmoor, she had this old fashioned 1940s telephone. And again, I took that apart with my dad, granddad's screwdriver set to find out how that operated, much to his disgust. <laughs> but anyway, he was quite happy in the end and he realised that you know, I was going to take a technical, technical career and he was proud of me. And then I explained to him before he passed away that I got him to thank for that because he let me play with his old telephone. So, uh, and it's also born out of frustration as well. So you'll see Captain Picard here face palming. Um, when I first started getting interested in security, I worked at a public sector organisation in Bristol and we were supplying software to the police. Every police force in the country was going to use our software. And yet nowhere in the test strategy was anything to do with security, how to do the security testing, who was going to do the security testing, and why the security testing needed to be done. And I questioned that with my team lead at the time. And she said, it's great, I don't know why it's not in there, but it's out of our scope, we don't need to worry about it. So who's going to do it then? I don't know, third parties? We're not involved in that. I won't get involved in that. Someone higher up will get to deal with that. And that annoyed me a bit, because I thought, well, you've got skilled people in your team, why aren't you using them? Why aren't you letting them loose on this software? Why aren't you giving them VMs to test on? And there just was no infrastructure or learning process behind that. And for them to send me on a security testing course would have been... They were a big organisation, they had a lot of money, but they weren't prepared to shell out. And they also weren't prepared to let me have time, the learning time within my own working day to go and do that off my own back. Working where I work now allows me to fit pretty much, as long as the work gets done, I can do pretty much whatever learning I like, which is great. Okay, one of the key things about becoming a security tester, or training to be a security tester, is understanding the applications that you're working on from the ground up. So whether it's infrastructure that they sit on, servers, whether they're remote hosted or whatever, to the, um, the way they fit together on the servers, so what application components do they use, ASP.NET, do they use MVC, do they use Java, whatever. Each of those components are going to have different vulnerabilities, and you need to consider that when you're testing. 
So if you're testing an ASP.NET application or an MVC application, those two components, although they're both built for the same organization, they're Microsoft components, they're going to have different things you're going to need to consider. Okay? Likewise, if you're testing um, on a different operating systems, for example, Windows Server or Linux or whatever, they're going to have different um, impacts to your testing. So you need to consider that when you do use security testing. Now, I am not a certified security tester. I'm just a regular tester who works in a context-driven organization and wants to develop better skills. At some point, I may get a security certification that says I can go and do this and the work that I've done is, you know, it ticks a box. But in our industry at the moment, there's a lot of kickback against certifications. I said and ICD and things like that. But I think security is probably the best place where you really, at some point, you need to cross that bridge to say, actually, I'm a certified security tester. Because it's about the only bastion left where you need to have something that's a lot of organisations won't do anything unless they get ticked in the box because they said compliant and they're meeting legal requirements. And sometimes that requires a security certificate. I don't have that yet, and I'm not going to pretend to you that I am that kind of test yet. I'm still learning. Okay, so Classroom Tester. He's a great resource. Uh, I hope you guys have a chance to look at Andy's blog at all. Yeah? Alright, one of my cartoons is on there recently and I'll show you some of that later. Um, Andy's quite right here. It's all about the attacks. Every web application in the world is going to have different vulnerabilities. And when you consider the security topology of your applications, every one of them is going to be different. As I mentioned, they've got different components, okay? And we've got our castle, we've got our bugs within the castle that we need to go and find, and we've got the people on the outside, the hackers, that want to get our data that's in the castle. Consider the castle our application server, if you will. Okay. Where do the hacks come from? So, does anybody know what this building is here? No? Okay, if you live in the southwest of England, GCHQ. This is the donut at GCHQ in Cheltenham. A lot of the top security experts in our country work there. Some of them work across the river, but most of them work there. Um, if you live in the southwest, you probably know someone that works there, or if you, they do tell you, then they probably have to keep. Um, now, a small amount of the hacks that come out of this country will come from this organization because they're doing it to, in inverted commas, protect us. Now, I'm not going to share my political bent here. I don't necessarily have one to share. But, you know, for good or ill, they do a job to look after us. And we all live, you know, you are here in a big city that needs looking after. You've got infrastructure here. You've got... Um, financial organisations and businesses and broadcasting down the road. So all that needs looking after and these are the guys that help you do that. And they generate a certain amount of attacks. Okay, so then you've got your hacktivists, anonymous, lulsec, people like that. And they're generally the, the grey hat hackers, the guys who want to do it but they're doing it for what they perceive to be um, reasons to um, you know, enlighten us on what's out there in the real world. Okay? But most of the hacking that goes on, and I'll show you some stats in a minute, and I've only got one slide of stats on, most of the hacking that goes on out in the real world is crime. People that want to steal data from individuals like you, and me, our data, our user credentials, our banking information. Um, our personal data. Um, if you've got Facebook accounts, yeah, they want that. If you've got Twitter accounts, yeah, they, they want that too. Okay, and your banking information. They want your money, they want to steal that from you. Okay, so it's a little bit of a stat. It's quite high level, but 61% of all the hacks that uh, come out from the world is since, since January up to last month, uh, month before last. 61% almost two thirds was from cybercrime. Now, this has come from hackergeddy.com, it's a pretty accurate blog. They collect a lot of data from all over the world and collate it. 
really worthwhile blog to visit. The rest is pretty much hacktivism, the organisations I met earlier, and um, the rest here is cyber, cyber um, so the, the red bit is people like GCHQ and MI6 and National Security Agency, and the other bit is um, state-sponsored cyber terrorism, which make up a really small chunk of the hacks that go on. As I say, most of it's crime. And organisations like mine, and like yours, who do retail stuff and data processing and payments and things like that, that's where they're, what's, that's what they're targeting. Okay, so some recent significant attacks. Okay, Twitter is a big one. The hackers out there, whether they're um, state-sponsored cyber terrorists or whether they're hacktivists or whether they're uh, criminals, they love hacking celebrity Twitter handles. Um, the most recent one that I can think of is, um, oh, chat can take that, I can't remember his name now, Gary Barlow? Yeah, he had his Twitter account in base last week, or week before last. Around about the same time that his tax stuff came out, someone decided to hack his Twitter account, just through brute forcing his password. I don't know whether he, he probably doesn't look after his own Twitter account. So whoever his public relations are, they've got a job to do to clean up their act, I think, there. Okay, go on, Orange. Now, we know them as a year here, but in France Telecom, Orange, they lost 1.3 million customers' data. And I don't know what happened to it. I think it was all put out on the web. Now, they still operate in this country, but on a different name. They can't protect their French customers. What makes them say they can protect their British customers here? I don't think they can. Uh, Bitly had their entire API and infrastructure undermined by uh, an attack recently. Um, you're a shortening company, but they also have a lot of other web technologies which are quite useful. Okay? Um, a lot of us use that because it's you know, quite heavy in the web community these days. Again, it's scary. Uh, now we're getting some serious territory. Belgium here recently had their government websites hacked by Ukrainian separatists trying to find out information about the EU's response to the Ukraine crisis. Again, scary. That's cyber warfare. Uh, okay, uh, uh, the Red Hat group, which is a Turkish group, they hacked a local government website in Turkey to try and get him uh, and defaced it in retaliation for what they thought was their responsibility for the Soma uh, mine disaster a couple of weeks ago. All right? And uh, the United States, pretty much all the hacks in the world either come from the USA or from Russia and China. There is a small amount coming from other countries. The UK is way down the list. We do about 1.9% of the world's hacks. Um, the United States does about one fifth, about 22, 25%, something like that. It depends, it varies from year on year. At the moment, the top hackers are the, uh, the Chinese, um, and the rest is Russia and America. Um, they had, there was a defense contractor that worked for the US government, and for five years, consistently, they've had their data hacked by um, an Iranian um, uh, state-sponsored cybercrime group called the uh, Ajax Security Group. For five years, a defense contractor. They should really know better. Okay. Um, and this one's probably the most scary one that I've heard of in the last year. Uh, in January this year, this is the Monju nuclear plant in northern um, Japan. Okay? Now, they had computers hacked in their reactor room. Not the computers that control the reactor, but the computers that contained HR information for the staff that worked in that building. Now, they're trying to decommission that site at the moment because it's on a fault line. But imagine if those hackers targeted the reactor control systems. I, I can't imagine the untold damage that they would have caused if that caused a meltdown. If most nuclear plants are put in remote areas, so the nearest one to here I think is probably Dungeness in Kent, Sussex near Rye. If you've ever gone down there, it's pretty remote, but still, if that went up, that's the southeast of England completely gone. Sorry, scary, isn't it? Okay, so, who knows at all about Star Trek and the red shirts? Anyone? Anyone geeky enough to admit? Do we know it? 
I always die. Hands up if you do. Yes. They always die when they get big down. Okay. Was that? They, they always die. When they, yeah, they okay. The rule is never been down to a planet in a red shirt. The reason why is the guys, is the security, are going to die. Okay? Some alien creature is going to blast them or absorb them or something. Okay, so never been down to a planet in a red shirt. The analogy is here before you start security testing, protect yourself. Okay? Captain Kirk's got a phase out and all the other guys are, but there's no way the captain's going to get killed because he's the hero. Okay, so the first steps before you start security testing or thinking about developing a strategy understand the threats to your systems. We'll I'll talk about Stride later on. Stride is a model for security threats, and we'll cover that later. Okay? Explore the OWASP website. How many of you here are familiar with OWASP? Cool, so pretty much most of you. If you're not looking at that now, then you should be when you get back to your desks, if you can. There's some great information there. Has anybody actually actively used any of the information on there during their testing here? Yeah? One, two, the lady in the purple green is nodding, that chap at the front there. Cool, I'm glad to see it. Please, go there, learn from it. There's great resources there, tools available for you to use. Okay, I'm not really a religious guy, but if I had to follow a religion, it would be the OWASP one. And that the 10 commandments of web security testing is the OWASP top 10. Now, some of you I know do web testing, some of you do back-end stuff, some of you do mobile, but pretty much these OWASP top 10 stuff will apply to whatever you're doing here. And we'll, talk, we'll cover a couple of those later on. I know there's a separate top 10 for mobile applications, and that will be worth looking at as well if you get a chance. Um, hands up if you do mobile testing here. One, two, three, okay. So go and look there, there's separate resources for mobile testing. I'm not a mobile tester, but there's great stuff there too, okay? And then, if you get a chance, learn some techniques and when to use them appropriately. Once you've got the skills or you earn the skills, if you don't use them right, you can get yourself in deep trouble. And I spoke to Dan and Steve about this earlier. If you're doing security testing in your organisations and you don't have permission to do it, you could cause unsolved problems internally, not just for your testers, there are other testers, but for live systems and things like that. Um, and there are some legal frameworks around which you, can, you, should be able to, you should do this. So there's the Computer Misuse Act, I can't remember which year, but if you hack a system, you can get up to two years in prison. And if you modify data on the system, I think it's up to 10 years, which is a scary prospect. So before you start your testing, make sure you've got permission to do it. All right? Or you've got an environment where it's safe to do it, that's isolated from the rest of it. Okay? Right. Understand your applications and their infrastructure and get to know your DevOps team. So we've got some engineers here, we've got some developers, testers. All, all three groups, you guys need to work closely together. Now, I don't know what kind of organisation you've got here, and you're all pretty much co-located, is that right? So you sit next to each other, testers sit next to devs, pretty much. Is that kind of the environment you've got? Okay, it's the same at my place, so I'm co-located with, um, hopefully, one more tester soon. I've got four devs around me in the technical lead, and I've got a lot of other fu uh, cross-functional teams as well in my organisation. And they've all got, you know, two or three developers, a couple of testers, and a, you know, scrum master or what have you, and maybe a technical lead. So get to know them, understand what they're doing, take part in code reviews, go and speak to your ops engineers because they're the guys that understand the infrastructure. And a tester, you kind of need to know the whole gamut if you're going to get a strategy for security testing. Um, follow blogs. Anybody here follow Troy Hunt? No? Follow him. Australian guy, works for Microsoft. He's really switched on, knows what he's talking about. The other day he tweeted about a security hack on iOS. Who's here an iPhone user? Uh, some of you, the rest of you Android guys. Yeah? Yeah, you're not protected either. Don't worry. Oh, picture's gone. Can you, 
someone hacked into the project. <laughs> yeah. So I was saying, follow Troy Hunt's blog and people like him. He reported an iOS hack the other day which allowed people to ransom their iOS PIN code. So basically locked it remotely using Find My iPhone and then sent a message to your iPhone via the little lock screen saying, contact me, otherwise you can't unlock your phone. Sounds pretty scary. And then, also do some courses as well. Now, Ministry of Testing, if you follow that, they've got a security testing course coming up soon, and another one in October, I think, uh, run by a chap called Bill Matthews. He's a really good guy. I've sat in on his course uh, in order to learn from him, and I've delivered a similar course at Romania recently, at Romania Testing Date. Um, some links to some places you can go and learn these techniques. There are a whole bunch of websites you can go to. Um, one is Altura Mutual, which is a ba fake banking site built by IBM. That's to sell their AppScan product. You don't have to buy their AppScan product, it's quite expensive. But it is a great website to try some SQL injection and things like that. There's a few others as well. Gruyere, which is made by Google, and it's um, like Swiss cheese, it's full of holes. So you can go there and practice the skills there as well. Um, there's a few others as well. There's um, OWASP Bricks, which is built by OWASP. Um, and it's basically got a set of modules you can explore um, and, uh, and simulate attacks on it, like um, trying to gain access via um, spoofing and things like that, and tampering with data and injecting stuff into the, into the fields and things like that. Um, They're totally free and you can access them for nothing. Um, there's another one people project, again it's not low or one, which runs locally on Apache and it's essentially a fake retail site for selling things. It's very, very basic, but it teaches you the basics of a lot of secu elements of security testing. Um, there's the buggy web app as well, which runs again on a little VM on your machine. Um, and you can run it locally, and you can test on there, learn how to hack to your heart's content on those kinds of tools. And I'll mention no more spricks. Uh, some of you work in the security, uh, in the mobile area, you might want to use Mobisec, which is a framework for emulating um, Android phones. I believe there's one for iOS as well, is there Steve? Yeah, there's within Mobisec, there's an extra Okay. Although, haven't they just changed the, is it Swift now? They must have got to do a new one, I would have thought, for the new, since yesterday's dead. Yeah, yeah, I guess. At the moment, it's a little Yeah. Well, it's a little while before iOS 8 comes out now, isn't it? A few yeah. months yet. Okay. Well, I think the most effective one is by installing a VM on your local machines. I mean, here you use VMs already for testing. Yeah. Spin one up for security as well, as well as your functional testing. That way you can ensure that absolutely nothing that you're testing touches any live portion of, the, um, of your service. And I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs here, but not every tester in the world thinks about doing this. So it's worth considering. Okay, know your enemy. I've already mentioned hackingagain.com, a great source of hacking information. They won't teach you to hack, but it will just make you aware of the threats that are out there. Worth following, looking at. Um, Security Ninja. Again, similar, great news from research resources. Go there. And these two hacker training sites, uh, they're kind of a bit grey hattish, but there's a safe environment for you to learn hacking techniques, and you can do it without the threat of being prosecuted. 
but that also gives, gives you a deep understanding, a better understanding of how applications can be undermined through simple things like misconfiguration, leaving passwords inside HTML files, that kind of thing. Uh, or trying to look for those kinds of stuff. Quite simple, basic things, but until you think about them, they're not actually you know, in the forefront of your mind when testing. Worth thinking about. There's a couple of those there. Okay, so Master Yoda has been a part of my life for a long time. And he taught me this. Once you start learning bad things, like the skills of the dark side, don't start using them for evil. Use them for good. Okay? Don't fall down the dark side. Okay, so. I play Clash of Clans. And I play on my iPad. So I just have a little threat modeling exercise with you. Throw up your hands if you can think of potential threats to this application. It's a mobile game, it's available on iOS and Android. Can we think of any potential threats to the application or a user's data? Hands up if you can think of any. Yes. Do you not payment? Purchase? Do you not payment? Purchases? Yep. Purchases. Okay, so you've got a shop here. Now we'll hook into the payment methodology for that particular ecosystem. So it'll go through iCloud, uh, iTunes um, or Google Play. But you've got mechanisms for buying things, so, so potentially you can intercept payment information using a man in the middle attack. I'll speak about a little bit about those later. Any other ideas? Dan? Sorry, mate? Yeah? My username? It's fairly explanatory who I am. Most users on this game make up some weird name. Rosie Sherry plays this, by the way, with her kids, but um, I'm thinking of joining her clan. So, um, anyone know here know Rosie? If you don't follow her, she's great. But she also plays the Clash of Clans. It's a secret place. She probably doesn't want me to tell you. Okay. Uh, any other potential threats you can think of? Yeah? People cheating at the game. Yeah, cheating at the game. Um, gaining advantage through hacking. I remember there was a... Have you any here played Bejeweled? Yeah. Okay. So there was a web version of Bejeweled and there was a plugin for Firefox that allowed you to get constant massive scores pushing you up the... The, um, the, the leaderboard. I, I, I can't avoid cheats. I love web gaming, and I, one thing I can't hate is uh, when I used to play lots of PlayStation, Call of Duty, and stuff like that, I couldn't abide people hacking the game to get, get advantage and get better weapons. Worst kind of bad sportsmanship. Any other ideas? One more. Email. Sorry? Email. 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 Uh, whereabouts? Here? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Essentially, that's actually internal messaging, so it's when the game is sending you a message to your screen. But that could be, if it was any other application, a, a potential email link that contained bad data. Yeah, good, good spot. Okay, what I think about though is when I built my little village here, I like to use the analogy of application security and apply to it. So I've got my town hall. That's my app server and my database server. I should have a nice clean code around it. So my defences, okay? So I've got my archers towers, I've got my, my, um, my money bank, I've got my energy here, and I've got walls around it. So I've got layers of code and application and good clean databases and secure databases. So this is where working testers, working with developers and ops guys to make sure that that's happening. And on the outside, side, I've got my firewall. I've got my more archers, I've got wizards protecting me, and I've got cannons. They should be keeping the attackers at bay. And the way you position your archers and your, and your cannons, so that it gets the most coverage. So when you're thinking about security testing, thinking about what you're testing when, how you're doing it, whether the code is good enough to go live, is it going to be wildly insecure? There's all sorts of different permutations and things to think about. Um, and when I started building this, I didn't think of that at the time, but when I started writing this, this doing this slide, I thought, actually, that's quite a good analogy. When you're building a village or an old-fashioned castle, security was the key thing for the person that ran the, the king or the, the local landowner. They'd have moats and they'd have portcullises to protect them. They'd have drawbridges. They'd have... Um, holes in the, in the walls to throw arrows out of. 
Has anybody here been to Bodium Castle in Sussex? I suggest you go. You've been, uh, I come from Sussex originally. It's one of the, the longest standing medieval castles there is. I think it dates back to William the Conqueror, even as far as that, I think. Um, and then they've even got holes in the wall and the roof so you can pour pictures of the hot oil or tar down so, to prevent the attackers getting in. I think it's a great analogy for security. Okay, so I mentioned stride earlier. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, I sort of in detail, but the main threats to your application are spoofing, to pretending to be someone you're not, tampering, fiddling with the data to get advantage, hacking the database essentially, repudiation. Okay, so let's say for example you've seen a transaction on your bank account and you can say, oh, that wasn't me, I didn't do that. And your, and your bank comes back and says, well, we've got a transaction that says you did. <coughs> Even though you've got, you've got no proof to say to them, okay, well, I didn't do that, that was somebody else. They can't, you can't prove otherwise. That's repudiation, okay? Information disclosure. Okay, so that could be simple things like leaving paperwork out of your desk that should be left out to security keys being left on the train, to people shoulder surfing, um, to um, hacking to expose data. Denial of service. Actually, I've noticed that denial is actually an anagram of Daniel, isn't it, Dan? Yes? <laughs> um, <laughs> Daniel of service. <laughs> um, essentially, that kills your service that's sent to you. So if you can't get online, um, using your, if Netaporter went down, how long do you think before you started losing revenue and reputation? You must have 24 hour services that keep it up, yeah? Ops guys monitoring it all the time. And I would have thought they probably got intrusion detection going on as well, so you can see hacks coming in. If you think your websites and your services are being hacked or attempts to hack it, then you're very much mistaken. There will be some going on now, there will be some going on tonight, there was probably some last week. Go and speak to your ops guys, find out what's going on, whether there's any recent attempts to attack the site. I guarantee there probably was. Elevation privilege. So let's say I'm a user, Joe user on the system. If I want to be, become Joe admin user, then some uh, attacker might hack the site in order to change their level of privilege from Joe, Joe user to Joe admin user using SQL injection, for example. We'll talk about some of the technical aspects of that in a minute. So, injection in a nutshell. Has anybody seen this cartoon on XKCD before? I know you have, Dan. Anybody else? You have? What's your name, sir? Uh, Mark. Mark, nice to meet you, Mark. Okay, so I've got two things for you here. So, um, I'll explain SQL injection here, which is the top most OWASP top 10 vulnerability. All right? Ladies had a phone call from her school, from his child's school, and uh, we've got some, something funky going on. Something's broken. Okay, and the mum has named him Robert, comma, open brackets, semicolon, drop table students, and then closed it off. Obviously, you're dropping the entire database uh, table called the students, or the database called students. Okay, so that's a great explanation of SQL injection. Essentially, you could do that via uh, an input to a field on a, on a form, or via a URL modification, or simply by sending an attack using an HTTP editor, using some tool like Fiddler or some other proxy tool, which I'll talk about in a minute. And essentially you can bring down the database using a simple query string like that. It does happen, and if your um, data inputs aren't sanitized, that's what will happen. So, here's an example of some SQL injection I did. On one of those vulnerable websites earlier, I, as a banking site, I log in with the username, and I end it with a sort of SQL here and then I put a single character in the password. Now the password's supposed to be something like demo123, but it doesn't care what I put in here if I end it with this SQL, okay? 
And now the SQL you inject in this field, it's going to vary, depend on what infrastructure you've got. So I don't know what you run here and I'm not going to ask, but it could be SQL Server, it could be Oracle, it could might be MySQL, it could be anything. So the type of SQL you inject in there is going to depend on the flavour of SQL you're running in your infrastructure. Which is why I said, get to know your dev guides, your DBAs, all those kinds of things. So you can understand the network topology, the, the application topology. When I logged into that using these credentials, I was able to access the admin functions rather than the user's banking functions. Thus giving me access to create users, change passwords, um, modify savings. I could modify transactions. And in that banking site I showed you, there's a ton of other vulnerabilities you can go and exploit. That's just one of them. How are we doing for time, Dan? Okay, cross-site scripting, or XSS. So, very simply, I'll just step back here to make sure I get this right. Number one. Dr. Evil sends a URL containing a script to the victim. The victim follows the URL because he trusts the application, the website that he's using. Imagine that if it was Net Porter. So your users trust your site, yeah? I'd hope they do. There's a load of sites that I trust. Amazon, for example, I trust. Um, I, try, uh, I try and trust my banking site, but I'm not very happy with my bank security. So, Victor follows the, the car and executes the, um, the scripts, which then carries personal data back to Dr. Evil. Dr. Evil then uses that personal information that's been captured in that script and creates a session using the Victor's data to access the site using his credentials. Potentially very damaging for the victim. But on the whole, not that damaging to the business, it's only affected one person. But imagine if they sent that email to hundreds of thousands of victims. Now, we're all pretty tech savvy folk, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't necessarily click on an email that contained, go to this website to claim this free thing or whatever. Um, I'd like to think you wouldn't anyway. But some people, oh, I had an email from my mum today. Now, my mum is about 60 years old. But she's now a widow, and my stepdad was really tech savvy, and I could talk to him about this kind of thing till the cows come home. My mum, I, I can't. So on Saturday evening, when I get from, back from Estonia, I'm going to be spending half, half of the afternoon trying to configure her antivirus to make sure that she feels safe. She, would, she knows not to click things, but she doesn't know how to set up her antivirus and things like that. So I'm kind of the family IT guy now. Um, this is what I did to actually execute some cross-site scripting in the, in the browser. Now most cross-site script attacks are executed using, using a URL that's sent to a victim. Here I've actually manipulated a search field and inserted some scripts. It's usually JavaScript, sometimes there's other cups of script or HTML. And I did an alert and an in brackets document.cookie. You can't see the rest of it here, but there are great examples of this on the web, and you can go and search for that yourself. And when I executed that command, I gave it a go, and it extracted the session cookie and displayed that on the browser. So if you go back and do that on your website now, and it does that, I'm sure it won't, because I'm sure it's really secure, um, then if you can see the good session cookie being displayed in the browser, then there's a problem there. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into the whole lot of top 10. One, I don't have time. Two, it'll be really boring. And three, uh, I want you to go and do some learning yourself. I hope that's okay. Here's some weapons of choice. Some tools that I've used to extend my learning and get testing done. Browser developer tools. Okay, so we all use a variety of browsers to do cross-site, uh, cross-browser testing. Firefox has got uh, plugins that you can use. Um, it's got out of the box browser tools now, but I've always used Firebug. Combination here. Chrome has got really good developer tools, which you can use to do basic um, monitoring of the web traffic. Good stuff. You can also look at performance profiles and all that kind of thing. Probably teaching you to suck eggs in. A lot of testers probably won't be as savvy as you or I. So, 
Um, days, there's a plugin for Firefox. You can intercept web traffic, modify it, we send it. I mentioned Firefox. Um, hands up if you test APIs here. You do, you do, you do. No, so a few of you. Do you use the Postman or what do you use to test your APIs with? Postman. Postman? Okay, so if you proxy Postman for a tool like Fiddler or one of the other tools I mentioned in a minute, so if you just point your browser with Postman running and you fire an API request for a proxy tool, it'll see the traffic going through it. So you can use other tools alongside security testing tools to exercise testing of APIs. Uh, you need to, and then you can probably uh, automate a script that did that for you. So a Python script that called an API and had a proxy tool monitoring the port bit and it's on. Great stuff. Um, I was to make a load of really cool tools. Mantra is a modified browser. So it's basically, they took Firefox, stripped it back, and added a load of cool kit on it, like a pack pad. Really useful. It's just you go and try running your tools through it and see what it does. Only just do it in the same environment, please. I don't want you getting in trouble with Steve. I'm, I'm not sure, he's not like the incredible part. I don't know what he's looking like when he gets angry. No? I don't think he does either. No, he's a very calm guy. Okay. Um, okay, man in the middle. I mentioned proxy tools. Fiddler. Hands up if you use Fiddler. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. If you're testing either web applications or mobile applications, you can proxy those applications through Fiddler and you can see the traffic that's going on in there. If you aren't using it, go back to this and download it later. Please, please, please. It's a really good tool. Okay. Then so attack proxy. Another OWASP product. They don't sell it, it's free. You can go and download it, it's a Java application, really helpful and really useful. Uh, you can use it to um, intercept traffic like you can any proxy tool. You can use it to spider a website and identify all the, all the pages that sit underneath a, a website. Um, you can passive scan, which essentially means to, um, when you explore the website, you're not getting any, uh, you're getting, um, feedback about potential vulnerabilities, but you're not actually attacking the site. And then it's got things like the fuzzer, which throws random data at it. And you've got a tool called the diviner, which will help you um, gather uh, testing information, devising a test strategy for a site as well. And then its most important tool is probably the active scanner, which will actively attack a site. Before you use that, do it on a VM, or do it on a place that it's designated safely to test on, because it's really dangerous. I can tell you what, I dropped our entire test database a few weeks ago because I accidentally spied in our admin tool. And all I had to go and do was speak to a, our DBA to get it brought back up from a data, from a, a backup the night before. But I wasn't very popular for a few hours. But, you know, I could have been even more serious. Third uh, suite, like I said, the tap proxy is a proxy tool that sits between the browser and the web server. It's not free, there is a free version, um, but the one I use is the paid for version. And I generally use these three tools together, um, and I proxy them, uh, I can go upstream and downstream between them. So I can set port numbers and IP addresses, so they can talk to each other, and they'll send data up and down the stream. And the, more to, the, the three tools together tell me more than one on its own, and I can get a better idea of the, the security information and pass that back up to my developers. Uh, Emma, has anyone here seen any of the Bourne, Jason Bourne movies? <coughs> yeah? When he attacks people with like magazines and rolled up, um, do you, what did he use in the last one? A tea towel, that's in there. Okay, so if you watch any of the IT scenes in that when they're in the CIA offices, generally, when you see a green screen with lots of text on it, that's Emma. It's a port scanning application. Now there's a, the, the Zen map is the front end GUI for it, but the, the green screen bit looks really cool on films. I think they used it on Elysium and they see it in the Matrix as well. So Hollywood love that application because it looks cool. Um, and, and these kinds of things have given hacking a kind of a, a veneer of excitement in Hollywood. And I think that's a, a, a it's great to look at on screen, but it makes it a bit unrealistic. And then there's a couple of others. Beef, as well as an exportation framework for the browser. Go and explore that, it's quite powerful. And then Wireshark is a packet sniffer. 
quite helpful. If you're sitting outside Starbucks, you can probably remotely scan there what's going on on their Wi-Fi. Okay, so where next? This is what I want to do next in my learning. I'm going to get automated scanning using the attack proxy in my business. I'm going to use this Python interface to do that. And then I'm going to put it into our Jenkins build server. And I'm going to do that before the end of the year. And then I'm going to talk about it at Test Batch next year. Please come and watch, if I get a place. <laughs> if I get a place. I need to talk nicely to Rosen. Um, I need to get better vulnerability and detection stats in my business's IT framework. So I can give them better information about the attacks that are going on and how to stop them. We have our app firewall. Everybody should have an app firewall when they're all around their um, applications, but they're just sticky blasters. If the underlying code isn't secure, once your app firewall is breached, it's not going to help you. Sharing knowledge, like I am now. I've done a few talks, I want to do more. Now, my wife and I, we're going through adoption proceedings at the moment. So I'm not going to be doing any more for about six months to a year. I hope they'll come back next year and do some more once I've done some more work and got more info to share. And what I want to get is increased confidence in my skills, but also other people will have more confidence in my skills and will come and ask me for help. So that's kind of where I'd like to take my learning forward. Now, I haven't really talked much about how I test yet, and my last couple of slides will talk about that. And I won't apologise for the following slides. Um, I'll just put it out there. I'm a massive Doctor Who fan. Huge. I'm probably the biggest nerd you know. But this word here struck fear into the hearts of thousands of children in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And even now, little kids. And I learned this word long before, oh, probably before I went to school and just after I learned the words mummy and daddy. So I use the word exterminate as a monomic for my testing. So I'll share that with you before I go, and then we'll have questions, and then we're going to have a drink, okay? So, E, X, explore. Explore the applications you're testing. Now this could be using formal charters. I don't know if any of you here use test charters, do you? Do you do, you do lots of exploratory testing? Yeah, no? Okay, Whatever. however you do it, Explore the application. If I've been shown a new application um, from new and I don't know it, I'll just go and play with the login interface or navigate the user interface, try and find out how it works. I'd have browser, uh, browser DOM tools running underneath to see how it's constructed. Is it PHP? Is it HTML5? Whatever. Um, I might have Fiddler underneath or some other proxy tool trying to look at what the infrastructure is. Right. Um, I mentioned the threat modeling earlier. I start to model the threats to the application based on what I see in front of me. What are the touch points? You mentioned the email bit earlier. So, so you, was that you? You, the email button on the, on the game, yeah? And the payment interface, yeah? Those are the threats. I'd start to identify those and form a strategy around that. What are the threats to my business? What are the threats to my application? Experiment. Once I've identified some of those threats, I'll try, I'm trying to exploit them. Try different things to try and get around security, around the user interface. The um, can I bypass the, user, the login user interface using some gadget or widget or fiddler or something? Risks. I've got to have those in the back of my mind all the time. What are the risks to the organisation that I'm either contracting for or I work at permanently? And that is reputational. My reputation, the business reputation, risks to revenue, and ultimately risks to the business. They're losing revenue because they've lost a reputation, that's it, they're out. A lot of startups fall by the wayside because they don't think about this. When they put their app out on the web or on uh, iOS or whatever or on Android, and then it gets killed by hackers and they've got no business model left. Monitor. I'm constantly using tools to monitor what's going on in my applications. Um, New Relic, for example, we use to collect um, performance information from the server. And I just use Paper Trail, which is basically consolidated logs, which pull information in from our web servers and also our app firewall. And I can see what's going on while I'm testing. Interrogate. Using the tools I've mentioned to attack the system, get information out of it, get detailed information, not just high level information. Get the header data out, 
get archiving files from Fiddler, send them to the developers, analyze what's going on, look at the cookies and how they're using, try and reuse those cookies elsewhere. Are they being you know, expired in a timely manner, that kind of thing. Analysis, once I've got those results, I need to collate them in a way that's informative for the business. Have they got enough information to make a decision and judgment on them? I'm not the one paying the bills here, I'm doing the analysis, they've got to use my analysis to make decisions. And if they can't make decisions, then we can't improve things. Targeted. I mentioned this briefly earlier, you do not want to test anything that you don't have permission to test. A lot of the tools that I mentioned, like Web Suite and Attack Proxy, will have methods where you can exclude other parts of the website from attack. So you don't attack something you don't want to get on them. Okay? That way you don't get in trouble. That way your test is focused also on a narrow piece of functionality. If I do a big bang on the whole test of my website, it'll take 9, 10 hours. If I just focus on one aspect of it, it can take minutes. Okay? Think about that. You can expand and contract your scope based on targeting. Expedited. I do it quickly or as quickly as I can. Sure as hell, someone's going to try and hack it before I get a chance to fix the bug. All right. And then when I do find something, I report it as quickly as I can, as pleasingly as I can, using the information that I've collated here. So that's me. That's where I work. That's how you can get a hold of me. Any questions? It's difficult to say, it's anecdotal evidence to say there's quite a lot going on. Um, I never mind that quite a lot of regular testers aren't, there, aren't encouraged to do it because one, there isn't a lot of um, interest in senior management and you don't want to see the thing embarrassed by security bugs. Sorry, I know your camera is cool. Let's go carry on. Couldn't hear Simon. Uh, you've got a challenge that as testers. I don't know what your culture is here. It seems pretty open. Um, if you find a security flaw, report it. And the more exposure you give to those kind of things internally, the more feedback you're going to get, the more interest you're going to gain. I can guarantee that your business managers, if they don't want there to be a flaw, that exposes risk to them, the business, and their customers. Because you've built a reputation here for quality, good products, and you want that to continue. Um, does that answer that question? Anybody else? No? <laughs> so I will again. So I've actually, you know, could go to prison. Um, but let's just say, do you remember a few years ago, before there were the days of tab browsers, which just had one page and you open multiple browsers, and then tab browsers came in around 2007 or 8. So I found a bug in the system that I was testing, and I logged in on one, pa on one tab with one user, and I logged in with another user on the other tab, and found that the second tab was using the credentials from the first tab. So this first account was being updated by the actions in the second account. And that's essentially an example of cross-site request forgery. And I didn't know that at the time, because I was new to this, this knowledge, and I didn't really understand it and what I was doing. I just thought, well, there's a problem there. And there's another one that I found where I was looking at an HR system. And this is a, a, an example of elevation of privilege. I was able to get hold of an HR system had a URL, and the URL was modifiable with an employee ID, so I could go to the employee record of another employee, um, of someone I didn't have permission to see, because they weren't on my management layer. They were on the same management layer or below me. I could also see people above me as well. Cool, eh? <laughs> Any, yeah, anything else? Any more questions, more sort of practical questions about testing and how I do it? 
No? Okay. Well, I think that's it. I'm a sore throat and I need a beer. <laughs> Hope that's true. <laughs>